So this presentation is on module four, topic three. It's about classifying data. I'll tell you what that means in just a minute, but first the materials that you will need as you go through this discussion, you're gonna need the workbook PDF file. We'll be starting on page 54. And you're gonna need the data spreadsheet. And if you don't have those open on your desktop right now, you might want to pause the video for a few minutes um, and get those ready before you continue. Now, just to make sure that you know where to find those, I'm going to switch over here to our website. So this is the home page in Canvas for the course. If you scroll down, near the bottom, there's some links here. This will get you the workbook and this will get you the data file and you can download those. I'll stop mentioning this after the first two or three videos, but you don't need to download every time you do work. You wanna just keep one copy of each of those. Keep going back to the same copy most of the time except occasionally I'll announce when there have been changes or updates. I come out with new editions of these. Every couple of weeks, I usually find a few typos or want to improve the wording on something. So watch for the announcements. And uh, up here under your account, you can set your announcement, uh, your, your notification settings to choose whether or not to receive those announcements. And I think I'd strongly urge you to uh, receive most of them. Okay. So I want to go on over to the workbook now to page 54. Um, So here it is. So this is the section on classifying data. And our goal is to divide the data up into groups or categories or classes by size. You might want to organize a, the values of a variable into sizes like extra small, small, medium, large, extra large, etc. So later we'll use these classes to make charts and we're going to want to make histograms. Let me show you a picture of a histogram briefly so you'll know what I'm talking about here. This is a histogram for the diameters of the oak trees. We made the dot plot or the, the number line plot in a previous lecture. And conceptually, I think you want to understand that one first. So if you've not done the previous um, lecture and homework on number line plots, go back and do those first. But another kind of plot that you can do makes these bars. And um, this bar A that I've drawn here, it's running from zero to 1.5 inches of tree diameter. And the height of the bar is 11, the units on the y-axis here are percents, 11 percent, and that's because 11 percent of all the trees in our sample fall between 0 and 1.5 inches of diameter. You see there are three dots, that means three trees between 0 and 1.5 inches diameter. Those three trees divided by the total number of trees or dots that you see in the picture is three divided by 27 is 11 percent. So that's how I get the heights of the bars. Now this particular discussion that we're about to do in the workbook is only about choosing the width of the bar. Each of my bars in this picture 
have a width of 1.5 inches along the X axis. So our class width is 1.5 inches. There's not only one good choice for that given a set of data. There's more than one way you could do it, but you don't have complete freedom. You can't just make up anything you want. And so the discussion is about choosing a reasonable width. When we made the number line plot, sometimes also called a dot plot, we worked out the scale of the graph. And I'll, I've written up some steps in the discussion that we're about to go through that cover that again about choosing the scale and then also cover how to choose the width of the bar. So those are two different things. The scale is the distance between the heavy grid lines on the graph paper, which we made one, two, three inches. And the class width is the distance between the edges of the bars. That's a different thing. Uh, the discussion we're about to go through in the workbook covers both of those items. So now I want to go back to the workbook. And so normally when we're in the classroom, I go through each of these questions. And these are the same questions that you would ask yourself in, in this order when you're working independently to make a graph, answering each of these questions in order leads you to the decision about where to put the boundaries of the bars on the histogram, the class boundaries. So um, all of the questions refer to our data about the oak trees. And so that is this set of data in your uh, Excel spreadsheet that I mentioned at the beginning. The different data sets are in tabs along the bottom. And here's the tree diameters. And we have diameters of 27 oak trees. The thing to note is that the smallest is a diameter of 0 0.8 inches. I've sorted them out in order, so the biggest one is down here at the bottom at 8.0 inches. I just want to comment that the data that you receive in real life or in this course will not always be sorted for you in advance. I'm going to take the opportunity right now to show you how to sort. So I just, I'm selecting all of these numbers and not the header on the top or the footer on the bottom. I just want to sort the ones that are shown here in the middle. Right now they're shown in increasing order and I'd like to change that, reverse it to make that decreasing order just to show you how, not for any particular reason at the moment. So I come up here in Excel to this sort and filter button. And I go here to custom sort. And if I wanted to sort by the age of the trees, I'd use column D. If I want to sort by the diameter, that's in column E. So I'll choose, whoops, oh, I need, before I do that, I need to click this button here. There's a check mark up here that says my data has headers. And when I selected the data, I did not include the headers. And so I clicked that checkbox to say that the headers are not included. And now when I click on sort by, it just it doesn't have names for the columns because you said no headers. So it just uses the column letter. 
The diameter is column E, so I'm going to choose that. I'm going to sort on the cell values. It's already going smallest to largest, so I'm going to choose largest to smallest. I click OK, and it reverses everything. And notice it keeps the rows together. That's why I selected all three columns of the table uh, so that it would sort all three of them, keeping the rows together. And now the biggest tree with a diameter of eight inches is at the top of the list instead of the bottom. Now I'm going to put that back right now. You know, you can always undo anything you've done. You can type Control Z or click the undo button up at the top. And so this takes me back to where I was. So what to remember from looking at this, besides how to sort, is just the biggest tree was 8 inches and the smallest tree was 0 0.8. And so now let's go back to the workbook. And here we are. So question number one says determine the range of the data. So I'll do 8.0 inches. Minus 0 0.8 inches. That's 7.2 inches range. Now this is just the discussion section. This would not be handed in, but there are similar blanks like this for you to fill in in the homework exercise, which I'll show you at the minute in a minute. As far as the workbook exercises are concerned, I grade those by hand, so you don't have to worry too much about exactly how you express this. You just need to show me the answer. And whenever possible, if there's space, show me a little something about how you got it. Just so, just so if you make a mistake, I can give you feedback and say, well, here's, here's where you went wrong. Um, okay, so the, the range is 7.2 inches. The maximum minus the minimum. Now, based on the range, choose the scale to use for the x-axis. So I can either count, I must count by a power of 10. So you're counting by ones, one, two, three, will get me up to eight inches fitting on the page. If I counted by tens, the whole graph would be really tiny. And if I counted by tenths, it would run off into the next room. So it's usually really obvious there's because it's a factor of 10, right? It's either one or 10 times, you know, bigger or smaller. So it's usually really obvious which one you need to keep it from running off the paper or, or on the other hand, keep it from being microscopic. It's going to be one or the other. But you get the scale right, it should fit. I had to turn the paper sideways to make this happen. Okay, well, let me show you that uh, graph again. So here's what I'm talking about. I forgot to show you the graph a second ago, but so if you counted by tens, it, it wouldn't do. Okay. Back to the workbook. Okay, so we have to choose a, a scale. And so here, here are the choices. And determine the scale. Now, to make it fit, I think you can almost always fit the answers into the boxes here. Because last semester, the students got me to make the boxes bigger. Uh, so for the ones they've had time to complain about, maybe it'll fit now. 
you have to abbreviate a little bit, but one unit per heavy grid line. Okay. Now, based on the scale, determine the distance between the adjacent minor axis lines. So those are the little lightweight marks in the picture. So there's 10 little lightweight marks for every one heavy grid line. So that gets us the decision about the scale that we're going to use. But now the question is how many of the bars should we use in our histogram and how, uh, how wide should each bar be? Let's start with how many bars to use. Now, a guy named Sturgis has a suggestion for this. And uh, in some software systems, when you ask it to make a histogram, if you don't specify how many bars to use, uh, this suggestion by Sturgis is often the default. And it's only a suggestion. After you see your graph, you can make some adjustments, uh, but you need to have a starting place, you know, especially when you're just learning this. And so here's a formula. Now, so in here is the sample size. It's the number of data items in your list of data. We had 27 oak trees, 27 individuals in our sample. And so n is 27. And so we need to do this calculation, 3.31 times the log of the sample size, and then add one. I'm going to do that over here in Excel. So, let's see, I'm going to move that over here. And I'm going to write justify this. So we'll do a lot of fooling around with Excel in this class. And, and there are other tools that just for the statistics part of it would be easier. There's a software package called R, for example. Um, but the thing about that is it's, it's very special purpose. And I think, and some students have also told me in the past, that they feel that, you know, for working in business, knowing a little bit about Excel is maybe more useful. And so, you know, this is not a course about Excel, but along the way you'll, you'll learn things about it that I think will be transferable after you're gone out of this course. Now I need to make a formula. So I've clicked on this cell J, column J, row A, it doesn't matter where you do this. It's good if you can follow along at home with this and just stop the video whenever you need to catch up or play around to figure out how things are working. So I'm going to click the equals to tell Excel that this is a formula that I'm teaching, that I'm uh, typing. Otherwise, it'll just... Um, take it to be plain text. And then I want to do 3.31 times the log. When you start typing the name of a function, it pops up the choices for you of 27. If you don't specify the base of the logarithm, it takes it to be the base 10 logarithm, which is what we want. Oh, the 3.31 is a conversion factor. If you've had algebra that did 
exponential and logarithmic functions. Okay, 3.31 times the base 10 log is the same as the base 2 log. So we could have typed less if we just said base 2 log. Um, it's, it's not uh, necessary that you know about logarithms or converting bases um, in order to use the formula. The important thing about the formula is it's a, if you make the graph of it, it curves downwards. So as n increases, I mean, it's an increasing function, but it, it starts out going up very steeply and then flattens off. And so what that does is, um, as you add more and more data, you can make more and more classes, more bars in your histogram without them being empty. So it lets you make more bars, but if you make the data size twice as big, you don't make twice as many bars, you only add one bar. And the advantage to that is that each bar will be supported by more data as you go along. You have more bars, but also each one has more data supporting it. So when you work out the percentages, they become more accurate. So that's why the formula is what it is. And if that, you know, is, is outside your experience about log and exponential functions, don't worry about it. You, you hit the enter button right now and you get a number. And you round up because you need a whole number. Why? Because this is how many bars will appear in the histogram, how many classes you're going to put your data in. And it, it only makes sense as a whole number. So it rounds up to six. And that is the number of classes that we will use in our histogram. So going back to the workbook, we're going to use six classes. So you divide the range by the number of classes. The range was 7.2 inches divided by six classes. And 7.2 divided by 6 on a good day is 1.2 inches for each class. So my smallest tree had a diameter of 0 0.8 inches. If I add 1.2 inches, I'm going to get 2. So, I'm using the built-in Windows calculator here. And then I keep adding 1.2 inches as I go across. So class B is going to start the bottom, the left edge of class B is right at the same location with the 
the right edge of class A. There's no gap between the classes. The top of class A, 2.00 inches, is the same as the bottom of class B, 2.00 inches. And then I keep adding 1.2, so I get 3.20. Okay. And then I get Four point four zero, five point. Well, I can't type. Five point six zero, six point seven zero, seven point nine zero, Where did I go wrong? Oh, I only needed, I only needed five classes.